So, Your Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to see that uh, so many uh, could come. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, despite the good weather or because <laughs> of the good weather. We'll not speculate on that and simply presume that it's uh, because uh, tonight's uh, discussion is very topical and tonight's uh, speaker is uh, an expert on that topical theme. Um, I'm especially glad to also, in the name of uh, the new rector of uh, the Institute for Human Sciences, Shalini Randeria, welcome uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Oleksandr Sherba, uh, um, Ukrainian ambassador to Austria. Thank you for attending. I know that you actually uh, is a frequent guest of, of the events uh, at the Institute. My name is Carl Henrik Fredriksson. Uh, some of you uh, know me as the editor-in-chief of the European Network for Cultural Journals, Eurozin. Uh, and as such, I've been a frequent uh, guest, uh, partner and participant in uh, events at the Institute. However, since a couple of weeks, I am more closely affiliated with the House as the Institute's head of publications. And it's as such as I will take part in today's discussion as well. This is this year's second political salon. Uh, since 2004, renowned scholars, politicians, journalists, uh, public intellectuals, have uh, visited this uh, library and participated in this discussion forum on current political, social and uh, cultural issues. Thanks to the long-standing cooperation with the Austrian Quality Daily Die Presse and uh, uh, also thanks to the engagement and generous support by a new cooperation partner, the EVN, we're able to continue uh, this uh, series of discursive interventions into a public sphere than, that now more than ever, I think, mm. is in need not only of informed opinion, but also of the political will to not only understand, but also form uh, society. The format of this uh, uh, evening's uh, discussion will come as no surprise to those of you who have attended these salons before. Uh, our protagonist will give a, sh a short introductory speech. This will be followed by uh, a discussion uh, between Mr. Christian Ulch, head of the Foreign Poli Politics Department at uh, Die Presse, and just back from a short trip uh, to Kiev, and myself. Uh, and uh, as so often during these political salons, I'm eagerly looking for forward to meet Mr. Ulch's questions and interventions. Uh, we will then, in good time, open the floor so that you all have the opportunity to ask uh, questions. Uh, I will only shortly uh, introduce today's uh, main guest, uh, Sergei Leshenko. Uh, he is, uh, since autumn last year, a member of the Ukrainian parliament for the Poroshenko bloc. Before he decided to enter politics, he was the deputy editor-in-chief of Ukrainska Pravda, which is the main uh, um, online uh, daily newspaper in uh, Ukraine, which uh, we just talked about this earlier today. During the height of the crisis, had more than one million uh, uh, visits per day. Um, uh, which is no longer the case, but it's close, uh, uh, close to that. Uh, as deputy editor-in-chief of uh, Ukrainska Pravda, he was, uh, uh, it's safe to say, the most prominent investigative journalist uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and also those of you who don't read uh, Ukrainian newspapers uh, probably know of uh, Mr. Leshenko's work because he did enormously important uh, journalistic work in um, uh, revealing uh, some uh, Ukrainian politicians, officials and oligarchs' assets here in Austria uh, about uh, 
a year ago. He is uh, also an awarded journalist, uh, among other things. He, have, uh, he has received the prize of the Norwegian Foundation Frit Ud and the Zeitstiftung, their uh, prize for uh, 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 journalism, as late as 2013, I think. I think uh, that is enough of an introduction. Um, I will not say anything more about uh, the topic, but leave the floor to you, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for this invitation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your interest. Uh, this is my second time to Vienna during the last weeks. I made a short stopover on the way from Tokyo to Kyiv in Vienna uh, last week, and there were two bad news. The weather was raining, and Mr. Firtas won the court case in Vienna. And uh, now I hope we will discuss this issue as well here in this audience. Thank you for these warm words. Uh, it's true that I decided to start political career after 14 years in Ukrainska Pravda, and uh, the main goal was to try to influence on the situation in politics from inside. We were writing a lot about corruption, and uh, we, we are trying to implement some anti-oligarchic measures, anti-corruption measures from inside, since we were elected in uh, October last year. Uh, I want to say that corruption is the most dangerous uh, the mo it's even more dangerous than Russian tanks. I think the most dangerous thing in Ukraine now. And uh, it's clear because uh, Yanukovych was a president because of corruption. He was a uh, child of this corrupt system. And uh, Russian aggression was possible because of very weak Ukrainian uh, army, which is, was also corrupt. And the Ukrainian budget is so poor because of corruption as well. And uh, at that time, Yanukovych subordinated oligarchs in Ukraine. Now oligarchs, I think, each oligarch is more influential than they were before, when Yanukovych was their boss. And uh, our goal is to reduce their influence on politics in Ukraine, on the everyday life of Ukrainians. And uh, unfortunately, some Ukrainian oligarchs and some people from Yanukovych uh, circles found the shelter in Austria, they enjoyed Austrian rule of law, Austrian banking system, they bought property here, they moved their families to Vienna, son of uh, ex-Prime Minister Azarov uh, established here even art gallery and uh, financed some luxury magazine, a family of uh, last head of presidential administration, uh, Mr. Kluyev, bought house outside of Vienna and uh, Mr. Firtas also has companies here and it was not a big surprise that he was going through Austrian streets when he was arrested because he visited Austria very often and there was even, as I remember, some tricky story with uh, Austrian MP from Green Party when his bodyguards uh, had some had some troubles with with this uh, Austrian MP, and um, I think now we have in Parliament the opportunity to try at least to try change situation, and I think the war is not a good excuse for the uh, lack of reforms in Ukraine and. Uh, unfortunately, last year was lost in uh, this permanent confrontation and we I think we now have to run much faster because we are wasting the time in the process of transformation. I think this uh, parliament is a more transitional parliament. Uh, this parliament will establish the new rules, the new approaches for politics. I think this parliament is going to be a platform for clashes in some future between different generations in Ukrainian politics because this parliament is a reflection of society. There are a lot of young politicians from civil society, from media, but there are a lot of old politicians from party of region. There are a lot of uh, politicians from business uh, who are just motivated to be richer. And there are a lot of uh, people with uh, good minds in their, in their heads. And uh, it's not available, uh, avoidable, uh, avoidable to 
have these clashes in future, and I hope that uh, we will win. I mean, young politicians with uh, with uh, good ideas in in our minds, and uh, we will do our best to to achieve these goals. Uh, now we have uh, three powerful oligarchs clans in Ukraine. One of them is Mr. Fitash clan, who was arrested here in in uh, in Vienna, and I think he just misinformed Austrian judge about his real role in Ukrainian politics because he was trying to present himself as a fighter for democracy, but he was just a corrupt oligarch who invests his assets, his TV channels in some politicians to achieve some business goals. Mr. Akhmetov is so powerful in energy now and I hope this parliament will limit his influence on the processes in energy sector. And Mr. Kolomoisky, he was just a clear example of oligarchic uh, politicians when he was directly in the position in government, at the same time he used his uh, presence in government to uh, enrich himself. And uh, he was resigned from his position, and I think it's a good example of limitation, oligarch influence, and uh, uh, we are, as, as a young politicians try to do our best to, to limit his influence as well. And, um, of course, uh, President of Ukraine, Mr. Poroshenko, I think he has to fulfill his obligation to sell his business because uh, he said this before elections and it's even more important to limit his influence on media sphere. Of course, we have some examples in Europe when Mr. Berlusconi was owner of uh, TV channels at the same time he was prime minister, but I think it's a bad example and uh, we, we, have, we should not follow such examples in, in, in new Ukraine after Maidan. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, this parliament is uh, this parliament has a good experience also in the um, in the limitation of oligarch influence. For in, for instance, we adopted this so-called quorum law, uh, which was regarding influence of Mr. Kolomoisky and company called Dukranafta. And uh, he has only 43 percent of shares in this company, but he controls the management. Uh, there since year 2003 and he continues to do this now but i believe in um, this year the management is going to be changed because it's unacceptable when oligarchs does just uh, you know doesn't pay any dividends to budget he this company has direct obligations before budget to pay 1.8 billion grivnas and he said uh, openly to journalists that he's not going to pay any any grivna just because he decided not to pay and uh, I think we will combine our efforts with some uh, Western, uh, I think, donors uh, who could push Ukrainian leadership to deal with this case. I think Prime Minister has to go to court to, to take this money to budget. And uh, me personally, I sent a lot of requests to Ukrainian leaders what they're going to do. And the uh, last reply from Prime Minister was that he ordered Ministry of Energy to do something with Mr. Kolomoisky. I think it's a, it's a bad example of political behavior. Po Prime Minister has to articulate his political will, his, uh, his will to solve the, the issue of Mr. Kolomoisky. And uh, this parliament also has a lot of different examples in, uh, leg 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 in uh, legislation process, but I think we achieved some success in disclosure of information and uh, this parliament adopted anti-corruption bureau law. Anti-corruption bureau is going to be completely new enforcement agency focused on high-level corruption. And uh, last month, new head of this anti-corruption bureau was appointed by president and now the process started and this new head of anti-corruption bureau has to uh, invite people on the position of detectives and uh, to start the, the whole process of anti-corruption policy. Also, this parliament adopted uh, public broadcasting law. This is another example to limit influence of oligarchs and to establish unbiased media. Because you know maybe that Ukrainian TV stations are owned mainly by oligarchs and if we have some independent media on TV, it will first uh, provide unbiased information for audience and second influence on another TV channels. Because if you have uh, some independent media coverage on public broadcasting, oligarchs media will think 
uh, should they provide biased information or not? Because people will see uh, unbiased news on, on public broadcasting. So I, I, I think it's one of the examples how new parliament is trying to limit uh, oligarchs' influence uh, on political process. Also, this parliament uh, did few symbolic steps, like uh, parliament is open for public now. So. Uh, each, everybody could come to Ukrainian parliament and take the, the seat on special balcony and to see how it is going on. Maybe it's a surprise for you because you have this tradition, you have this right for a while. In Ukraine, this is just a new tradition. You can order the place in parliament and to watch the, the whole process from inside. And uh, another symbolic step, for instance, parliament disclosed information about uh, MPs assistance and uh, we found out that uh, Yanukovych mistress was appointed as assistant of uh, Mr. Lovishkin's uh, sister. She, she, is MP, uh, she is a member of Ukrainian parliament and uh, I sent the request to prosecutor general and they started the criminal investigation because this is an example of misuse of public funds. She was paid as uh, from budget of Ukraine and she did not do any any job. She was just uh, uh, appointed as assistant of MP. Of course, it's not a big deal. You can say you we want to see Mr. Yanukovych in cell. Me too. I want to see him in cell as well. But uh, he ran from Ukraine, and uh, it's it's you know not easy to finish this case. I'm not going to be advocate of Ukrainian prosecutors because they waste the time in investigations and uh, uh, there is a new challenge for them. They have to charge Mr. Kluyev before uh, next sitting of European Council. First of June is a crucial date for Ukrainian prosecutors. If they don't charge Mr. Kluyev, European sanctions are going to be withdrawn from Mr. Kluyev and he could come back to Vienna and to enjoy Vienna, you know, Vienna summer <laughs> and to, to reunite his family here in Vienna as he did this uh, during Yanukovych time. So uh, there are a lot of things we have to do and uh, some, something we have done and uh, we, I believe we have to combine our efforts, uh, efforts of uh, Ukrainian politicians who are motivated by reforms and efforts of uh, international society, of international organization, of European donors. And uh, I believe that the approach could be one, only one. Uh, financial support of Ukraine from abroad only after reforms. Because it's very you know, easy to, to take European money, money of European taxpayers, and then to do nothing. And a uh, very you know, uh, effective way to engage Ukrainian politicians to be more productive in reform is to say, first reform, then money. I believe this approach could work in Ukraine. And uh, of course, another goal of Ukrainian Society is European perspective. I believe only after reform we could achieve this goal. And thank you very much for this invitation again. I am ready for your questions. Well, thank you very much for your opening uh, remarks. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you have mentioned, I've really been shortly to Kiev with the Foreign Minister Kurz. It was a very short trip, just a few hours. Uh, but there um, he met uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister, Mr. Klimkin, and they had a talk in the evening and, and, and Kurz uh, was addressing the issue of corruption. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Klimkin, uh, in his answer, mentioned that he only earns uh, 200 euros per month. And I, I just couldn't uh, believe it because this seems to me like uh, an invitation for corruption if a politician gets uh, uh, this ridiculous uh, sum, which, uh, which well, well you, can, you, can, you cannot live on this. So, first of all, is this uh, a correct information? It's completely correct information, yes, and this is the worst example of Ukrainian populism. Um, this step was done by current Prime Minister, Mr. Yatsenyuk, who was not very successful in the reforming of Ukraine during last year, and that is why I did not vote for him as MP uh, for the position of Prime Minister. And um, 
he just decided to demonstrate that he would like to cut uh, state expenses by limiting of salaries for uh, state servants. But, you know, it's much easier to, to produce this uh, policy than to take money from Kolomoisky. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is unacceptable. What I'm doing personally, I, after, after this decision of uh, uh, government to limit the salaries, I accepted the invitation to be a uh, visiting uh, lecturer in the private university in Lviv. And also I'm writing the articles for Ukrainian and uh, foreign media. And uh, I don't know what another MPs are going to do in this situation because the salary in, in, in uh, two, two, two or three hundred euros per month is direct invitation for corruption. Mm. I, I, I agree and I like that you raise this question here. Uh, of course, I will post on this <laughs> on my Facebook. Mm -hmm. Of course, I will read a lot of criticism uh, uh, on my address after that, but you cannot address issue mm -hmm. of corruption if uh, your uh, ministers are so so low paid mm. so so you would basically say you basically said in your opening remarks that that in fact uh, nothing has changed concerning uh, corruption i mean you've tried to you've tried okay, you've tried to, to change something through through laws but in fact in uh, fact we have problems with that and uh, i cannot say in other words because you will not believe me you visited ukraine you saw people you asked people and you know the real situation i will not say it's not a true of course it's true we have problems with corruption and i continue to stress that corruption is the main problem for ukrainian society this parliament adopted some law this is systematic changes and uh, you cannot address this huge problem without systematic changes, without institutional measures like anti-corruption bureau, public broadcasting. Another idea is to establish public uh, financing of political parties, the system which works in Austria, in Sweden, in all European countries. This law is going to be presented in Ukrainian parliament. I'm head of working group in anti-corruption committee to uh, prepare a draft law. Of course, first parties had, have to open their bookkeepers' uh, records. They have to demonstrate who paid money for them and they have to be completely transparent. After that, public money could go to parties. But uh, in sense of low-level corruption, there are problems. Tax administration, road police, medicine, schools. Corruption is like part of Ukrainian mentality even because some generation of Ukrainians were growing up in this atmosphere. But I cannot say that nothing is going to be changed. For instance, uh, from, the, from June, we will have so-called experiment in Kyiv, when we will start police instead of militia. Uh, this process, mm, I think, it was started in, in the end of February, maybe. So hundreds, even thousands of young people were hired on the position in new police. They will replace this old style, old fashionable Ukrainian police officers. The uh, idea is to start in Kiev, then to have this experiment in another region, and then to establish this system all over Ukraine. So I believe it could work. We'll see how it's going to be. Another problem is the uh, health system. It's another challenge for new minister. This, this person doesn't have corrupt Ukrainian background. Because uh, former Minister of uh, Health, Ms. Bogatyryova, she is now in wanted list of uh, Ukrainian authorities and even in Interpol list, because she was involved in corruption. I hope the new Minister of uh, Health will somehow address this. I cannot say what he is going to do, because it is his part of obligation mm -hmm. to reform this. But idea was to invite completely new person who was not part of mm. conspiracy deals in medicine in medicine of course uh, i i would like to say that your attention on this issue is very important because you stress this attention and ukrainian government cannot say that we have never heard about this as much you say this it i think it's positive 
and it will uh, it will push Ukrainian government to to deal with this. But this is uh, in May last year, I think it was. You published an article in in yours in which became a kind of mm -hmm. a standard reference uh, when talking about Ukrainian. Uh, corruption and, and about the oligarchs. You, it was a typology of Ukrainian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. and they were all mentioned there, including uh, Poroshenko. Uh, and uh, you, you write in this article that this change will be a long haul, but it's, it will be possible, but it will take generations. Mm -hmm. This is what you, what you write in this, in this text. But then, uh, and, and this, uh, your recipe, so to say, to fight uh, corruption there, is partly a legalistic one, mm -hmm. but partly a mentality change mm -hmm. program, so to say. But after uh, the Maidan protest, you chose the way of the lawmaker. You joined the lawmaking body, the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, I presume because you think that the institutional reform is now, would be, so to say, the basis on which any mentality change uh, can uh, change. But w how can one go, because otherwise reform, uh, we know this from other examples in, in Europe as well, reform can very much be a show reform. One, one, one takes a law, but then it's about implementing it. It's about uh, seeing to it that it works. And the implementation is very much about a, a change of, of culture, a change of mentality. What is that other uh, action, so to say, which is not the, the parliament, but which is civil society, which is perhaps media? What is it? Y you know, uh, I understand now that uh, to be journalist is much more comfortable to be a politician. <laughs> <because> <laughs> to ask the question is much easier to answer. But uh, first I would like to stress that now in Ukraine it is fashionable to disclose corruption. So we have, I don't know, maybe not even dozens, but hundreds of investigative journalists. We have them in Kiev, we have them in uh, regions, we have them on TV, we have TV programs, we have critical uh, TV stories about president on first national TV station. It was uh, impossible to believe even, I don't know, one year and a half ago. So something is going to be changed and the process of transformation is going on. And uh, I think that civil society and journalists, are they even more motivated in changes than officials, bureaucrats, politicians, and all my hopes are connected with these people, watchdogs and journalists. But from another side, uh, I believe, okay, I would like to believe that Anti-Corruption Bureau will start real anti-corruption uh, investigations on the very top level. For instance, uh, you asked me about salaries. The Anti-Corruption Bureau has speci very specific law. They have much higher salaries. Uh, they have few few thousand euros salaries per month, completely different one. And uh, of course, I think it, it, it's worse to have uh, good salaries for these people. So they have motivation because I don't. I, I think millions of Ukrainians. Uh, believe that uh, this bureau could be effective. And uh, if they don't achieve the result, I don't know. We, okay, we have to review, we have to maybe appoint another head of anti corruption bureau. But this process is uh, not possible to stop because the Ukrainians on Maidan was not only because of Yanukovych, they were because of corruption, they were because of oligarchs, they were because of this permanent misuse of power on top level, but on the middle and low level. And uh, the demand from society is very strong. And if current president, current prime minister, current parliament do not achieve this goal, we, president, prime minister, are going to be replaced another, by another politicians, and these and other politicians will implement these changes. So this is a challenge for whole, politi whole political class in Ukraine to, to achieve this goal. Um, also, I believe that journalists could play a very important role by disclosing the, this, this misuse of power, by cor disclosing of corruption. And uh, I do my best to support journalists here. I am sending different uh, official requests or letters to start some criminal cases after journalist story. So 
I can promise only that I will do my best to achieve this goal. But uh, the whole politicians in Ukraine could understand that if they are not successful, next generation will come and they they are going to be successful and uh, this goal will be achieved in some perspective. But of course, better to achieve this result in short perspective. But you still feel that you have uh, you have the space, you have the room uh, to act. Uh, uh, as in, in Poroshenko block. In the Poroshenko <laughs> block. You know, first it's maybe strange for you to hear, but I don't have any like direct obligations because we were invited to this political list without any straight obligations. We did not sign any, you know, act or promises to do something. We are not gonna be advocates, and uh, I think our obligations in. in front of Ukrainian society is much stronger than obligations before some politicians or political leaders. And uh, regarding the influence of leaders on the members of political faction, uh, we have 150 we have 150 MPs in faction of Poroshenko. It's impossible to rule such huge faction with the iron fist. So, in fact, uh, it's I think we are the most liberal political faction in parliament because uh, there are so many members in this faction and uh, I have, I believe I have a lot of room to do what I want to do in, inside this faction and uh, during last month there were no examples of pushing me to do what I don't want to do. And for instance, I did not vote for prime minister as I mentioned before because I really think that he lost his chance during the first year after Maidan and nobody told me that you know, I did something wrong, nobody called me with some threats, no, it, it, nothing, nothing, nothing happened. So I believe uh, that like reformers in the uh, faction of Poroshenko and people from Cecil society, from media, they will play a more important role. Because I think we are more connected with this generation of changes than another politicians who were part of business. Mm -hmm. Well, this could also be a sign of, of chaos if nobody calls you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> There's no <Fine>. sheep whip. <laughs> no, no, but but have you have you told? I found it remarkable that you that you've mentioned that President Poroshenko did not fulfill his promise, did not sell his shares. Did did you have the chance to tell him personally? Frankly speaking, last time I met him, it was December last year. So since that time, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, he didn't come to the gathering of faction and mm -hmm. uh, he did not invite me i did not ask him for meeting but mm -hmm. uh, uh, i'm free in my activity so i i sent request about corruption in government in uh, parliament uh, and nobody mm -hmm. called me to do to with some with some uh, order so you you would like to say maybe this is uh, not the team game but what is the team game in this situation? I think, as I mentioned before, our obligation uh, before society is stronger than obligation before political mm. leaders. Because, you know, uh, there is no, it is not my dream to die in the chair of member of parliament. That's what they all Bec say. Yeah, yeah, we have some MPs who <laughs> were elected eight times, seven times, six times. It's not my dream to be the politician, especially when the salary is so poor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if uh, some, if they decide that uh, there is no room for such uh, liberalism in faction of, of Poroshenko, mm -hmm. okay, we'll uh, we'll accept this this approach. But you know, I think Poroshenko is smart politician, of, uh, and you agree that he's a smart person because it's impossible to achieve such high uh, levels, such results if you are not smart. He's a smart person, and he understands very well what is demand of society. Uh, maybe he, he will uh, implement these reforms because uh, he achieved a lot in business. He is not motivated by personal enrichment, I believe so. But ambitious, uh, to be the most successful president, I think it's quite good ambitious and he could uh, go toward this goal, go uh, in direction of this goal and the position of president. I mean, yeah. As a member of parliament, you have some inside and you, you know people. Do you, do you think that, that uh, MPs are, s are still being bought? Still what? Still being bought by mm. oligarchs, by maybe also 
foreign actors? Uh, I believe that influence of oligarchs is strong. And uh, I, ma I mentioned, for instance, three clans, mm -hmm. Firtash clan, Kalamoyski clan, Akhmetov clan. They are representative of all these clans in different factions. For instance, Akhmetov, he plays through opposition bloc. Firtash plays through opposition bloc and from a political group of uh, um, headed by Igor Yeremeyev. And Kalamoski played through another political group and through some agents mm -hmm. in the uh, People's Front. But uh, I think the crucial mess in Parliament is on the side of politicians who motivated to make changes happen. At least I hope that they will understand that if they don't achieve, this Parliament will not stay in power longer than, I don't know, one year, one year and a half. And, uh, we have to do as much as possible during our <coughs> term to limit the influence. Uh, how to fight against oligarchs? It's not possible to fight you know, against one oligarch. Okay, we achieved some success in the sense that Kolomoisky was resigned. But tomorrow somebody could be even more powerful than Kolomoisky. We have to implement these institutional changes. And uh, one of the examples is political uh, financing from budget. <coughs> Also, we have to disclose all final beneficiaries of uh, TV channels. We have to ban uh, <coughs> commercial uh, advertisement of political parties during political uh, election, politi presidential or parliamentary campaigns. Because now, last election, it was just competition of uh, pockets, you know, who paid more for advertisement. And uh, there was even information that one minute on one of the private TV stations was about 200,000 grivnas. At the time, it was $20,000 per one minute. You can imagine how much was paid during campaign by each party, if mm -hmm. only minute was $20,000. So we have to limit this uh, presence of money in politics. Um, and I don't know if it's true or not, but um, Anders Oslund, uh, you know this American, yes. Swedish economist, Swedish, he, yeah. he, he told that the whole campaign in Sweden cost about uh, 12, 15 million dollars for whole parties because there is no room to spend such huge amounts of money. Advertisement is free on public yeah. uh, TV stations and uh, there is no technology te technologies to use like uh, uh, different tricks which are you know, well known in Ukraine when a lot of people are paid by political parties. In Germany he told that the whole campaign for all parties cost 95 million, something like that. So we, in Ukraine, it cost two, three billion dollars each election. So we have to, or maybe last election was cheaper because each campaign was very short and there was a political uh, economical crisis in Ukraine, so it might a little bit less. But in general, we have to uh, limit presence of money in politics in Ukraine. But and so to do this possible only by s institutional changes. But some of these institutional changes will uh, and has already, uh, with Kolomoisky it's, it's, it's clear, and, and with some others as well, will uh, involve uh, what one could call reprivatization of, mm -hmm. of, of property and, and, and so on. This has happened several times before in Ukrainian history. For example, after 2004, the Orange Revolution, this is what made many of these oligarchs t into the rich people that they are today. What is it that says that today uh, uh, such reprivatization or whatever will not result just in a new set of tycoons, uh, just a new set of people uh, uh, with uh, access to both money and, and power. I don't like this word reprivatization, and um, I think uh, there is no room for such words in new government. Uh, compared with 2005 when Yulia Timoshenko was Prime Minister, I remember the time very well. I was, uh, as a journalist, on a uh, uh, meeting of government, and after the meeting she came to journalists uh, with a smile on her beautiful face, saying that we are going to reprivatize 3,000 uh, companies in Ukraine. And it was a shock for stock market, for foreign investors, for... Uh, economy of Ukraine. I think Poroshenko and Yasenyuk understand that this is uh, there is there is no way to deal such such way. Uh, but I think we have to use anti-monopoly measures. Uh, this doesn't mean that some assets could be uh, 
take by another oligarchs, but some companies has to be, have to be demonopolized. For instance, Ahmetov. He controls about 70 or 80 percent of uh, producing of energy uh, by private companies in Ukraine. And uh, he is a monopolist, uh, but he was not recognized by monopolists. Mm -hmm. And during Yanukovych presidency, it was even changed the uh, rules when monopolization level was changed from 25 up to 33 percent, just because he was going to buy some mm -hmm. energy assets. And of course, it's not acceptable because he could di dictate uh, his uh, his uh, rules. And last uh, March of uh, coal miners on Kyiv was just artificially created by Akhmetov just to blackmail government to demonstrate his power. And uh, I think we have to appoint independent anti-monopoly uh, anti -monopoly leaders uh, in Ukraine. Just, and just to explain that last, last part, because I don't think it's known to everyone that, that uh, uh, after Kolomoisky, uh, Akhmetov is now, so to say, in the, in the, in the focus of authorities, yeah. and he has then uh, allegedly staged uh, 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 a strike of miners mm -hmm. in Kiev to show his power, mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 so to say, uh, scare off the, the, the authorities in this. Um, let me come to Austria uh, yes, for please. a minute. Um, Is somebody going to buy new assets from Ukraine here? <laughs> we have new oligarchs, maybe they want to invest I, something here. I, I, I wanted to know um, whether you think that uh, Mr. Firtas, whose extradition to, to the USA has been rejected uh, by an Austrian court, uh, is is still uh, politically influential in in Ukraine. Yes, he was right when he said that he is politically uh, influential person. But his influence is a bright and not bright, but good example of oligarch mm -hmm. influence. So he was not, you know, you know, thinker or uh, you know, leader of uh, some ideas. We want to have something to achieve something. He was just. Primitive example of oligarchs, when you buy some politicians, you appoint your friends on the position of head of presidential administration, you appoint another friend on the position of head of secret service, you appoint your people on different uh, uh, state economy agencies, then you, you buy your state assets for, uh, half of the, for, for, for half of real price or even cheaper, and then you become rich and then you part of uh, international deals with Russia. If you know, his um, uh, chemical assets were uh, bought uh, by Russian money from Gazprom Bank. And his, uh, w this 125 million euros mm -hmm. were paid from Moscow as mm -hmm. well. And uh, I think he's influential. And this victory in Austria, uh, he will use this in Ukraine, saying that European judges said, I am not guilty, I am clean, and after that he will try to increase his influence on Ukrainian politics. Unfortunately, what happened in Vienna last week, it is a not a, it's not a positive for Ukraine, for policy on the limitation of oligarchs' power, unfortunately. Why it, is, it, it happened here? I think because uh, of money, because he invests millions of euros in lawyers, in lobbyists, he hired former Ministry of Justice of What Austria. do you mean by that, that, the, that an Austrian court has been bought I, by I, him? Or? I think he bought lawyers mm -hmm. in sense of advocates. Mm -hmm. He bought a uh, team of lawyers who build this strategy of protection, saying that he is victim of political... Uh, Maybe the American case wasn't strong enough. I mean, that's also a possibility. That I th I, as, as I know, uh, Americans did not send a lot about this case here. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Uh, I know what I know. Uh, I know FBI agent Brian Earle, who was investigator in Lazarenko case in in 90s. And he is a part of FBI team in charge of Firtas. And he said that... Uh, they have a lot of evidence that Firtas is guilty. And uh, their problem was that one of the witnesses ran from US to Moscow. His name is Lal. He's an Indian guy 
who uh, witnessed uh, in US that Firtash was paying these bribes and now he said that it was done under the pressure from FBI. I don't believe this guy. Uh, I think he, he said true the first time when uh, confirmed that Firtash was bribing Indian authorities. Because it's so natural for Firtash to buy politicians to pay bribes. So, uh, in sense of Austrian uh, judge, I believe that he was misinformed by Firtash. He present himself uh, as a, you know, a thinker, as a people with person with a political agenda. He tried to invest in some politicians to have a better future for Ukraine. He was motivated by his personal enrichment, and he bought politicians in Ukraine during the decade. You know. He started in the middle of uh, last uh, last decade, when he popped up uh, on the gas market after Timoshenko disappeared. It's true, uh, but I hope maybe it's possible to review this case in in appeal court. I don't know. Uh, I don't believe that uh, in Ukraine Firtash uh, could be prosecuted. Why? Because of judge system. Because of. Uh, of uh, unreformed judge system, he maybe he could run for parliament now, when he come back, if it's if it's possible, of course. I don't know; it's just speculation. I I really don't know. But now we have preterm election in some constituencies, and he is free to come back. Why not? And he could say as a proof of his uh, fairness that Austrian court didn't find any evidence of his mm. crimes, which is not true. What is your take on, on Fiatr's agency for the modernization of it's Ukraine? Where it's just a laundering machine, just to launder his reputation. There is nothing behind this. So, uh, we haven't, haven't seen any activity by this agency in, in, in Ukraine. It's just a, a show. I agree. So the idea was just to launder his reputation, to present mm. himself as a reformer, as a thinker, as a you know a person with some perspectives, but the real goal was just to present himself in court and on the Western audience that uh, he he's uh, somebody else that he is in fact. So for him, it's just waste of money, and uh, I believe it's better for European former politicians to stay outside of this agency. Mm. I would before we open up for 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 questions. I would like to go back to to uh, Ukraine and and the room for politics. Uh, just mm -hmm. a, a general a general issue which uh, has concerned me a lot uh, uh, since February 2014. Actually, uh, you talked before about that there is room for you in the Poroshenko bloc to do. Uh, this or that. My question is about how much room is it for reform, if you want to use that word, or for politics in general in uh, Ukraine today? Uh, I will shortly try to explain what I mean. On the one hand, uh, your, this uh, room is pushed from the so-called legacy of the Maidan uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. And no one is, uh, it depends completely on who you talk to, what this legacy actually, wh what this legacy actually is. But uh, one such legacy is the, uh, what one could call the sacralization of the sacrifice uh, uh, that was uh, undoubtedly uh, taking place on the Maidan, which uh, is manifested in the so-called heavenly hundred. Mm -hmm which means that this is a legacy that is so strong and so holy that any type of compromise and any time of, of type of politics is actually threatening to betray that legacy. On the other hand, you have the war in the East. And these, these two rather different pressures, uh, it seems to me, uh, makes the room for real politics, which is mm -hmm. uh, compromise, negotiation, reconciliation, all sorts of, of things, very small in Ukraine. Am I right, or, or is this a, a, an outsider's naive First, view? Uh, I want to repeat that war is not a good excuse for the absence of reform. Second, war is a challenge, is a, is a challenge but it is, from another side, chance for reform. It's a good chance because you, during the reforming process, 
government has to do a lot of unpopular things. In some sense, it's a shocking therapy. War is another shock. So it's better to combine two shocks at the same time to have, than to have two different shocks. You know, war is a shock, reform is a shock. Let's do this together because during the war, people believe you more. You have more things to achieve during the war because you can say your fellow citizens, my dear Ukrainians, we have the war and we have to uh, reduce. Uh, financial support for some categories of population. We have to increase prices for gas. But this is a challenge we have to do through this challenge during a few months. It is better than to say, now we have war, in one year he, will, he or she will say, let, let, let's have another shock. And unfortunately, this was not achieved during last year by current government. I believe uh, the current parliament will push government to, to do this because, of course, each politician wants to be re-elected. If politicians do not achieve this goal, they're not going to be re-elected. Uh, in sense of, uh, in sense of uh, Maidan, uh, Maidan was, it's pathetic words, but it was some kind of born of new Ukraine. And if you don't fulfill this demand, as I mentioned before, new politicians will come, come and do this work instead of you. So I hope Yatsenyuk understands this. And a very clear example for him, he was not doing the reform because he uh, feel, uh, fears that it's, it could uh, reflect on his rating. But the result was the opposite. His rating is so poor now because there were no reforming at all. So, uh, he was trying to do something, but uh, the result was opposite. Um, <coughs> and another, you know, thing which uh, is optimistic for me. Each Ukrainian leader, since 1991 up to 2014, was playing the game between Moscow and Brussels, between Moscow and Washington, between Moscow and Berlin, between Moscow and Vienna. He was visiting Moscow saying, give me more money or I, will, I would go to Brussels mm -hmm. or to Washington. In Brussels or Washington, that politician uh, said, give me more money or I will go to Moscow. Now, Ukrainian, any Ukrainian politician does not have second option. He could not come to Moscow asking for financial support. Mm -hmm. he, they, could come only, they can come only to Washington or to Brussels asking for support. And of course, these organizations, IMF, international organizations, uh, governments of European countries can say, okay, okay, we could support you, Ukrainians, by money of European or American taxpayers, but first we want to see the result. And this will push reforms much more effective than, you know, our uh, rhetoric, rhetoric uh, you know, uh, uh, rhetoric or some articles or something like statements in Ukraine because Ukrainian government really needs money and the uh, West could use this opportunity. Do you think right now that the West is, is too generous and that, that it does not attach strings to the financial aid? Say again? Do you think that, uh -huh. that the West, Western institutions mm -hmm. are too generous in a way with their financial aid by not attaching strings on them by not um, asking for the fulfillment of certain conditions? In some sense, uh, I saw this 200 pages memorandum between IMF and Ukraine, but sometimes, you know, government promising something but do not achieve the result. So I believe the only successful way to implement the reform is to have very, you know, simple mm -hmm. approach. First reforms, then money. It's you know very easy for politicians to waste the time and asking for financial support without any result. It's maybe it's not. It, it sounds even unpatriotic, but mm. my interest is to reform Ukraine instead of, uh, you know, to see some politicians on the position of uh, leaders. It's much more important to have reformed countries than to to have some some leaders. Uh, I think that we should now open up for, for, for questions uh, from the audience. Before I uh, 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 give the word to anyone, uh, I want to say three things. Uh, we, it's, this uh, event is a little bit later than we usually 
R, which means that we will try to end on time, which uh, would lead to the second thing. I would ask you to be as short and precise as possible in your questions so that as many as possible can actually ask uh, uh, questions. And uh, thirdly, uh, because this is uh, uh, a very uh, sensitive issue that we are discussing here, I'm also asking everyone to be uh, harsh and critical, but as polite uh, as possible. I also think that we need uh, to, uh, to uh, you should wait until you get the microphone before you say anything, because the, the discussion is being recorded. And I would also ask you to introduce yourself with with name and if you want to affiliation. I've just seen Katrin Karlweit. Yeah, and it's I think she's, she's, she was getting nervous. <laughs> no, no, what you. Yes, I okay, think this, which this I cannot see. Yeah, okay. I think the <laughs> in the corner here is the okay. first one, and then we okay, have I'm the sorry. In, in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, An Andreas Schwabe, Raiffeisen Bank International. Um, you just talked uh, uh, about shocks and uh, a last chance to reform. Uh, how do you see the possibility that uh, the shocks and uh, are too much and the last chance is uh, not taken enough? In the sense that, for example, we have now a deep recession, we have a devaluation by the Rivna of two-thirds of its value, the average wage plunged from $400 to below $200, a wage you know. Um, so is there a chance that uh, it becomes uh, destabilizes at, at some point? that uh, the opinion switches from we want now to take this chance to this government is not better than the one before. We are now poorer and worse off and we want something else and, and what? I agree with you in sense that time was, wa was waste and uh, in Poland uh, main reforms was done during few weeks, even 12 days, as I remember. In Ukraine, we are, you know, wasting the time in explanation why it's not possible to do this or that. But I still believe that it's not possible to achieve the goal without these reforms. And uh, from another side, maybe you know who is the most popular Ukrainian politician now? Poroshenko. Yeah. So he has this chance, he had this opportunity in his hands to achieve this. And of course for politicians it's very sensitive, but if you sacrifice your rating, your uh, political support, your future in politics for your nation, your nation will pay you after, of course. If you don't, you will see what was happened with Yatsenyuk when he was 22 in the end of October and now about six or seven. You know. he, he lost uh, two-thirds of his support during the last months. In, so, I agree that it's dangerous, but society still want to see the result. And if you are fair with the society, you can explain that during these months we have something to do next month, but you have to demonstrate starting from yourself. We achieved this, we uh, resigned some state servants who are not very active, who just was uh, on the position and doing nothing. We started to change police, we started to change tax administration, customs, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I agree that risks are, are here, but the challenge and the chance is also here. Mm. Maybe we take some questions in a row. We can take some questions in a row, yeah. Okay. Sure. I just wanted to make two remarks. The Agency for the Modernization of uh, of Ukraine will start its work on the 13th next week. I was told by Karl Georg Wellmann, who's one of the co-founders of that thing, they're, they're meeting here in Vienna, and then they, he said everybody's going to be emph em emphatic about starting their work. So that was one thing. Um, what I'm, I don't really agree with you, Sergei, um, all, because I, I have, I'm fearing that uh, the euphoria that you are uh, sharing with us about those changes um, I'm afraid you are counting on enough time, and I'm afraid you might not have it, because um, I'm not sure about the influence of the Russians that are trying to get back through Firtash, for example, through Akhmetov and all those oligarchs that uh, are not being fought uh, strong enough at the moment. You were telling us about examples of what's being tried, but not what has been reached. 
Um, it's not clear and out in the open how much uh, how strongly the, the Russians are still involved in that game. What makes you so, sh so sure, for one, that you have got enough time, maybe even a generation, as you said, and second, um, I'm afraid that you make the same mistakes, the mistake that we as journalists all probably make, the Austrian journalists, especially hoping that when they write about uh, Hypo Alpa Adria or about Grasa, this will change the society, and it does not. So what makes you so sure that all those investigative journalists, all those news programs who have, which have changed, uh, de definitely, we all know that, that this is changing society when at the same time you told me yesterday that corruption uh, in society has not changed a single bit. A gentleman in the back. Hello, my name is Andrei Harris. Uh, Sergei, um, uh, Mr. Firtash uh, was raised as oligarch probably by uh, Yushchenko and Yanukovych. Mr. Akhmatov was raised by Kuchma and Yanukovych. Uh, Mr. Kol Kolomoysky was, uh, was raised by probably every president. And uh, uh, do, you see, do you see and do you know any names of uh, potential oligarchs uh, who can be raised by current uh, still corrupted system? <laughs> This is first question. Second question. Uh, I think we take one for, okay. for now so that we uh, uh, get. We'll take a couple of more, and this is the gentleman in the short sleeves. Well, uh, it goes very much in the same direction. Uh, we want probably a bit more uh, confidence in your, uh, your assessment that reforms will be carried through. Uh, looking ahead two years from now, um, Ukraine is going through an incredibly tough economic time. Uh, uh, real incomes are falling. Uh, inflation is now 60%. Uh, uh, pensions have been cut, etc. Yeah? Uh, if we go back to the early period of Russian reforms, the Gaida reforms, things turned rather quickly to, um, in the population against reformers. So uh, are two shock therapies popular? <laughs> Are they improving the lives of people that you will keep them behind you? I think that we will actually take this now because this, th they are so connected, all these, these questions. As a Katrin Kalvart, uh, first of all, is there, is there time? Do, do, why, what makes you think that you have time? And I, I, I did not say that we have a lot of time for this. And I think um, it's going to be clear for current leadership this autumn when we have... Uh, local elections that they are losing support in society. Next elections in October. And uh, I, um, I'm afraid that the result of some parties is going to be uh, another one than it was in October last year. And uh, I agree with you, but I can raise the same question as you do. What the, the, the question is how to address this. and. Uh, of course, I am not the uh, advocate of uh, political leadership of Ukraine, but I understand that my role in parliament is to deal with anti-corruption issues, with some examples of corruption. And I'm trying to be as much as possible effective here. Uh, is it a good example for political future? Maybe not, but as I mentioned, uh, for me, it is the same challenge as it was for for another uh, young people from Maidan. We are teaching, we are learning to be politician, and maybe we are not very uh, successful in this because we are trying to be fair with you, with society. Of course, I can say you that we achieved a lot in reforming, but you will not you will not believe me, and you're right. The result is not so impressive, but. On, we have to do as much as possible on our position, where are we now. Now I am in the position in Parliament, and I am trying to do as much as possible. Andriy is a member of uh, National Commission for Energy Regulation. I hope this commission will deal with Ahmed of monopolization, because this is a challenge for the whole society. And uh, regarding Andriy's question, I think there are some risks that uh, we will hear the name of new oligarchs, especially in agriculture sector, because uh, 
this parliament is surprise, surprisingly for me uh, packed by agriculture barons, agriculture tycoons, their representatives. We have in uh, for just one example, maybe it's interesting for you. After the elections, uh, it was um, the time when each MP from faction of Poroshenko had to decide which committee they want to join and which position in that committee. And uh, uh, the winner of this competition was Agriculture Committee. There, was, there were nine candidates for the position of head of Agriculture Committee, only among members of Poroshenko faction. So this is committee number one now in Parliament, Agricultural Committee. So there are some risks that new agriculture tycoons will uh, grow up during this time. And uh, I, I share this risk and, I, you know, uh, it's much better to create some, as I mentioned, institutional measures than to, you know, uh, try to, uh, you know, start this hunting today against Kolomoisky, then against Akhmetov, maybe in a few months against some agriculture barons. We have to limit the influence through the systematic changes. And this is was how the uh, problem addressed in, in, in European countries in, in previous century. Let and uh, mm -hmm. yes, the, the last question was about reforms. I agree that it's a huge risk to lose the support among society. But if you see the ratings, number one has Poroshenko, number two has Sadovy, two party of persons who represent themselves as the reformers, the people who are ready for changes. Uh, if they waste the time here, of course they will lose the support. But now still there is a chance to, to do this. I don't know how long is this chance. Maybe, of course, as fast as possible. They have to achieve something until local elections. If they don't, the result is going to be dramatic. In October is local In October, elections. This let, year. let me yeah. just paraphrase um, 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 uh, a remark Mrs. Carvet has raised because I find that interesting. Do you think that, that, um, Russian, that Russia sh still has leverage uh, via oligarchs into, into Ukrainian politics? <laughs> Uh, maybe they have some influence on Firtash and on Akhmetov, I think. Because first Akhmetov just uh, was... Uh, so if you go inside his loan package, you see a lot of Russian money. Uh, in some sense, he is a hostage of the situation. And maybe that is why he was so passive during the aggression on the East, because he was between two fires. From one side, he wanted to keep the situation stable because any destabilization is bad for his business. From another side, he is in pocket of some Russian banks. And uh, he made a mistake during last year, I think. He lost a lot of support among society, among politicians, and uh, uh, he is a, you know, he is a good target in sense of demonopolization because he did a lot of mistakes and he bought a lot of property during Yanukovych time on unfair privatization competition. And he's still worth, I think, 6.8 billion dollars. 6.8, it's uh, his... Uh, I think Forbes... Uh, he lost. He lost a he lot. He lost a lot, he but I think lot. that's the, the latest figure actually still. Oh. Which is... But it, he was about 16. Yeah. He was about 16 a uh, few years ago. So there I have four people uh, on my list here, here, uh, here. Uh, but first, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you so much. Uh, I have my own theory about Ukrainian reforms. Uh, and uh, mm, I think that we are right speaking about uh, corruption and about uh, oligarchs and everything. But sometimes we we forget about uh, the key problem that made uh, these two problems possible. And this is the completely outdated, incapable, uh, old Soviet-style state apparatus in Ukraine, the bureaucracy. In many cases, the corruption was the only way to do anything, to complete, implement anything, because otherwise 
uh, all the good ideas, all the good, you know, uh, things that uh, some good people come into the government with just got drowned in, in, in the swamp. As a result, uh, we are now in a, with the bureaucracy, with, 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 with the army that, uh, or we were at the beginning of the war, with an army that wasn't capable of, you know, of fighting, with, uh, you know, diplomats not capable of speaking foreign languages and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, really, uh, and um, I am, what makes me very hopeful about this whole situation in Ukraine right now is uh, the influx of the, of the, the, the appearance of the successful reformers from abroad uh, in the government, uh, the influx of you know, people from the private business uh, in the key positions in the ministries. This is something that was not uh, bred uh, and, uh, and educated by this uh, state apparatus. But, Sergei, we, I think uh, maybe sometimes many, many politicians, they under, underestimated. I don't want you to make this mistake. Uh, the apparatus has to be, you know, uh, completely... Uh, the, 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 the strengths of uh, uh, what Saakashvili did was, you know, really breaking this old, outdated system down, or at least creating a system, a capable system within the system. Maybe you can comment on that. That is the Georgian example, which uh, in many places, but uh, above all in, in Ukraine, is uh, uh, regarded to be a good example of how one can fight uh, corruption. Uh, yeah, I agree that uh, if, you, if you come to Parliament, uh, this is, I think, last example of so-called so post-Soviet uh, body, because uh, there is uh, so many people who are doing nothing. At the same time, they have uh, special position, they have special payment, special security for future, and uh, of course, we have to reform this. But the question is, who is in charge of these changes? So we are in charge of these changes, and we can criticize, but from another side, somebody has to, to start this. And of course, it is in charge of Prime Minister and the President to do this. They have to start this process of reforms. And if they are not successful, I will lose my position in Parliament, and maybe you will lose position in Embassy as well. Because people will not accept this uh, anymore. And regarding foreigners in government, I agree that this, is a, this could be interesting and successful. But, for instance, I remember when, in the end of last year, current Minister of Finance arguing us to vote for special taxation of import, plus 10% for import in Ukraine. But the result now is this smuggling is increasing. And uh, in the figures, we lost the import. <coughs> it means that people started to import things without payment any taxes. So sometimes they believe in idealistic, you know, uh, mechanism. But in Ukraine, if you start to implement this, um, the result could be opposite. But in general, I completely agree that foreigners could be um, much more successful in reforming because they don't have these corrupt links between different clans, between different politicians. And I even sometimes uh, dream that maybe it's better not to... Uh, have a competition between different candidates for position of head of tax administration, of position of uh, tax administration or customs administration, but to just to you know ask you know Germany or uh, Switzerland or Swedish people to take charge over the customs, over the tax administration, and to do uh, you know to sign the contract with them and to say. You are in charge of this for one or two years. You have payment. You have even more, even maybe interest from this. But please do everything you think will be successful for reforming. But of course, it's just a dream. Uh, it's not acceptable for by Ukrainian law. But uh, in general, again, I support the idea to invite foreigners. 
I th correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the reformation of the traffic police is done by Georgia, Georgia, yeah. uh, Georgia, Georgia, Georgia which is minister. also being regarded, which was a great problem, and which is we'll see, we'll see how successful is going to be this experiment. Uh, at least I believe in experiment is better than to do nothing. We're uh, uh, rapidly approaching the end, and I will. Uh, uh, I have a lot of people on my uh, list. But we'll take three uh, questions now, and this is first the gentleman in the in the tie. Uh, good evening. My name is Mayan Madela. I'm working for the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. My question would be basically one. Um, I now I forgot what I wanted to ask. Yes, um, you were elaborating a lot on the fact that now it's the the major challenge of Ukrainian society and uh, Ukrainian politics to contain oligarch uh, influence or to, to, to fight it, corruption. My question would be basically, how do you see or what do you think, how could a feasible solution look like in the midterm perspective, bearing in mind that most oligarchs right now are basically in control of the major assets of uh, the Ukrainian people. Uh, and there's just a number of them, 10, 15 people. And on the other hand, you're saying you don't want to open this case of reprivatization because you know that uh, the rule of law is basically crucial when it comes to foreign investments for a country, which there is a need of. So how could this look like? Is there a, a kind of a grand bargain solution? Is this somehow feasible? Because this is a contradiction you, you, you somehow need to solve. Uh, the gentleman in the striped shirt. Uh, I have just one question because I have to restrict myself to one and I choose the following. It's not at the center of the topic here, but I think it's interesting, at least to me and to, I think to the mothers. Uh, I heard from an Ukrainian lady, which, is very which seems very reliable to me, that in Kiev, uh, the administration and on the high ranks of the army, they're always leaking information to Russia or to the Russian opposition. Is this true? Mm -hmm. And uh, Anna, here in the corner. Uh, my name is Albena Škodruva. I am a researcher and a journalist and a fellow here. And I wanted to ask, um, in the light of what you said already, is there a vision on judiciary reforms in, in Ukraine and what is the, uh, how, how does it send as a priority in your mind? Because we witnessed in the, in the last decade very painfully how many post-communist countries actually stumble critically in their reforms precisely there. Thank you. Uh, I would suggest that the, the rule of law question and judiciary uh, reform question somehow belong to, together. So the first and the third. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the main mistakes was done in the beginning of the 90s, when that leadership of Ukraine decided to establish so-called national capitalist or national bourgeoisie instead of selling the assets to European companies as it was done in Poland, in another post-Soviet, post-socialist <coughs> countries, even for very cheap price or without any payment. Because this process motivated European companies to include Ukraine in the European agenda, then European politicians to include Ukraine in the European agenda. But in the 90s, it was wrong decision of president and prime minister to privatize the assets for Ukrainian oligarchs. And of course, now they are very powerful and they control sectors of Ukrainian economy. How to deal with this? I think reportization is not the solution, but Demonopolization could be a solution. In this sense, some assets could be sell to another companies. And I believe it's better to have European companies or American companies which buy these assets from oligarchs instead to have oligarchs war for these assets. So if we imagine, for instance, that at anti-monopoly committee says, Mr. Akhmetov has too much in energy and he has to sell one of his uh, energy plants, Zahid Energo or uh, Dnieper Energo, it's better to announce uh, open uh, competition for these assets among European companies than to propose another Ukrainian oligarchs 
by this, these companies. And, uh, you know, we can just uh, imagine what, what could be next, but I, st I still support that, including of Europeans, uh, invitation of European investors could be a solution for, 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 the, the, for Ukrainian developments. And uh, regarding the rule of law, uh, this area really needs reforming, and uh, the special law was adopted a few, few months ago. Uh, during last week, there was a lot of news from uh, creation, from the process of uh, selections persons to Supreme Judiciary uh, Council. Uh, after that, these people will be in charge of uh, changes the judges. Mm, I was not supporting this approach. I was more uh, on side of uh, the law proposed by Deputy Speaker Ms. Seroid and uh, reanimation package of reforms. But was uh, this law uh, was adopted? Uh, there is some vision of reforms on the presidential office. They want to replace corrupt judges and to establish new courts instead of some corrupt courts. Some, in some sense, they are even uh, victim of this corrupt system, even presidential administration and his representatives. For instance, uh, there were a few cases when Mr. Regarding, okay, again, Mr. Ahmetov. Uh, for instance, uh, he, he came to court and he achieved a result which he was looking for, for instance, about one billion uh, debts uh, he, he, he have to pay to energy market of Ukraine. And he doesn't want to pay and he came to court and the court said, okay, you have one year and a half more, Don't, do, do not pay this, this amount of money. And uh, it was done against the will of presidential administration, as I know, because they were looking for some uh, way to, uh, to stop his uh, uh, enrichment, I would like to say, on energy markets. But uh, corrupt judges uh, implemented this law and, th sorry, this, this decision, and uh, he did not pay this one billion agreements. Uh, now he has special, uh, uh, special obligation to pay this during the next one year and a half. And uh, I think uh, Poroshenko will, will understand that without successful reforming of uh, judge judge system, he would be not successful president. And uh, re regarding leaking of information to Russia, uh, frankly speaking, I'm not very well informed about this, but uh, it could be possible because this is a part of, you know, if you have corruption, we can imagine that somebody, you know, sell the information to Russians. But uh, I'm not sure that now it happens very often. It was some information one year ago, some examples of this. Now I'm, I did not hear this. And I hope if it's happened, okay, we have secret services to prevent this. Is it possible? We can imagine that it's possible because corruption is part of Ukrainian politics, a part of Ukrainian army, and uh, we cannot avoid this. But I believe still that secret services have enough uh, measures to, to stop this. Uh, we're well over time uh, already, and I would uh, I unfortunately uh, uh, take back uh, the word here for, for a, closing, uh, a closing round, uh, I, which I can start if, if you want to. Uh, I, I'm pretty impressed uh, by your um, uh, strong statement <coughs> that uh, first reform, then aid, first reform, then support. Uh, you're constantly stressing the homework that uh, you, as a Ukrainian member of parliament, have to do and uh, has to do, and and Ukraine uh, has to do. Uh, you say, um, if we don't do it, we're gone. There will be someone else. Uh, I don't know what you mean with that, actually, if that there would be someone else yeah. doing what you couldn't, y or... Pre-term elections. Yeah, pre-term elections, but yeah. who is that then that, that takes advantage of that? If you can't do it, with all the, with all the, the, the 
aura and all the, 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 the leverage and the kind of impetus that comes from, from the Maidan revolution, who couldn't? Who could then do that? And therefore I would ask you uh, actually to, to, if you could, could uh, uh, because these are two very radically different futures uh, for Ukraine. You make it or you don't. Uh, and what are these, these, these futures? Is there then the European perspective for Ukraine if you are not, so to say, ousted uh, at the pre-time, uh, at no early elections? Is, or as a what is there? What is in store for Ukraine? Uh, as I mentioned, Ukraine could, cho could choose between two ways doing nothing or implement some European uh, experience because for now we don't have this second option to go to Moscow and say we want to be part of customs union. Mm -hmm. This idea lost support in society and dramatically we lost part of territory where this idea was supported. So now we don't have majority for this idea. So two options. First is reforming and to go by track, like Poland did. And second option is to be in permanent crisis like Latin American countries. So I think the, the solution the solution and uh, uh, two, two scenarios is artificially saying Poland scenario and Latin American scenario. Yes, I just want to thank you for your frank and open remarks, but I have to admit I'm really a little bit uh, depressed or sad mm -hmm. that because you've raised this idea twice in this evening that, that um, foreign actors, foreign countries, foreign institutions uh, should help you. You said you're dreaming of, 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 of Swiss uh, accountants and Swiss taking over and, and uh, not Austrians, no, <laughs> and, and, uh, and international institutions uh, attaching strings on financial aids and so on. So it leaves me with the expression that you, you are not convinced that uh, Ukrainians can do it on their own. Uh, but you want to hear the my real ideas yes. or my real thoughts yes. or you want to no, see yeah. like a no, uh, no, no, no. artificial okay. politician who no, no. say of no, no. course I believe in no, something. No, 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 I just want to share my, my you thoughts know, with I, you. I, I was writing about Ukrainian politics 14 years only in Ukrainian Pravda. So I sometimes I'm too much informed, you know, to understand how it's going. And unfortunately sometimes I don't believe in Ukrainians on some positions mm. because, uh, you know, with salary of 200 euros, you cannot be the good, uh, you know, storekeeper where uh, 200 billions of euros are stored. Uh, sometimes I believe that it's not possible to do by Ukrainians. But this is the truth which I want to say instead of, uh, you know, some political tricks. Maybe it's more natural for politicians to, to say this. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good evening.